Amen. So Sister Linda invited me, uh, I don't know how, a few months back, and, um, but they hadn't called me with the uh, theme. Usually the, every women's conference has a theme, and I thought, okay, maybe they're not going to have a theme. But I was praying, and I, oh, the clock is right here. It goes by so fast. Anyway, and I was praying, and, and God gave me a word for this conference. And then, and usually when I get a thought, it, you know, it's birthed out of God's word. And then I thought, I need a story. I need a story. I love women's uh, stories from women in the Bible. I said, I need a woman from the Bible to, to, to go with this idea that God's given me. And anyway, I still hadn't heard from Linda, and then she shoots off some big old long text. And she told me, um, yeah, I should open it up through, through, the, through the looking glass, right? Somebody say it. Anyway, I should, I should have written it down. But anyway, they gave me a scripture. And I thought, oh, man, they gave me a scripture. What if it doesn't go with everything? I have to start all over again. And anyway, so she gives, they gave me a scripture. It says, for now we see in a mirror dimly. But then face to face. Now I know in part, then I shall know fully, even as I have been fully known. And so I started digging in, and it went exactly with what God had given me. And God is faithful. He fully knows you. God sees you. God hears you. And you are his daughters. We are his daughters. Isn't that beautiful? And so, um, we're going to break down this, kind of unpack this scripture. Life can seem dark and confusing at times. As, as in looking through this blurry mirror. As an example, for example, one of, what the um, commentary said, I believe it was the Adams Clark. He says, um, like looking in through this telescope and everything's obscured and, and shrouded by the, by the clouds and the fogs. And so I thought what came to my mind, my, the image that I got was I told the guy, see, if they could, oh, here we go. See, I live in San Francisco, the San Francisco Bay Area. I live across, I live on, um, right here, we're looking at from the South Salido. And this is the image I got. You know, it, all you see is a peak in the Bay Area. In the mornings, there's this fog that rolls that's there, and then it, it, it dissipates, and then you can see and then it rolls back about three, four. So if you don't get up on that hill on time, you can't see the view. And sometimes you can't because it's just a cloudy, foggy day. Have you ever heard that San Francisco is a foggy city? It's a very foggy city. So that's the view. And so that's us. Sometimes um, life can, you know, we, we get discouraged because this is, this is the idea that God gave me. We get discouraged because we do not see God. We do, not, we do not see what lies ahead. We, can't, we don't know what lies ahead sometimes in life. And that could be scary. And if you guys could show me the next um, picture. So, that is the, so that's the view still from the South Salido uh, end. This is, the, this is my favorite view. This is my favorite, favorite view. If you, I'm going to walk over here. So this is where the people stand. You park over here. We always take our guests. Everybody wants to go over there. We get bored after a while. But, but this view is amazing. And I'm always hoping this is the day that, we, that it's going to be a be beautiful, clear day. And this is what they're going to see. All the sailboats, the city, and the Golden Gate Bridge. And I've walked halfway, and I get lazy, and I go back. So I haven't walked all across. I, I've, maybe I have, but, but at two different ends. I go from one end and then back. The other, from the city to the middle, and then from South Salido to the middle. I don't really go to the city. My kids do, but I don't like going to the city. Anyway, so that, that's, that's the picture that I got when I read this scripture, that um, now I know in part, then I shall know fully. Some things we won't know till we go to heaven. But God... God, he sees us. If we could go, if you could keep the other one posted, the foggy one, the one with the fog, we could, we'll keep that one posted. Um, so life can seem dark and confusing at times, right? And so the thing is that we get discouraged because we don't see God and we don't see what lies ahead. We begin to think he's absent from our lives. Have you ever felt that? Where's God? Yet God is there. 
He is present, working and orchestrating circumstances that are beyond our control. Even when we only see in part, God sees the full picture. Amen? Amen. So the problem is we stare at our lives and our current circumstances rather than looking to Jesus. And so when we take, when, when we look at our lives instead of at Jesus, all we see is these dark clouds, this shroud of, uh, of fog, and it shrouds our faith. And that's something we have to guard ourselves as women of faith, as Christian women. Don't lose our faith. Amen? And that's so important. And so because we think he's absent and nothing, we don't see nothing happening, uh, you say, I'm waiting in vain. Nothing's going to change. You ever feel like that? Nothing's going to change. And that's what the enemy of our soul, Satan, wants us to think. He never gets tired of going after God's daughters. Remember, who did he go after? The first person he went after was Eve, the first daughter of God, his first creation, his first beautiful woman. He went after her. Now, how did he go after her? He went after her with lies. And, and that's how he comes to us. He comes with lies. So when Satan lies come to our mind, we need to kick them out in the name of Jesus. Can you say amen? amen. And put our faith, amen, and put our faith in the promises of God. That's the other piece that God really put in my heart that it's, you will, will revisit is that we need to put our faith in the promises of God. Amen. And so we got to remember that God is faithful, God is good, and Satan wants you to think otherwise. And God's word is the one true mirror. I see this mirror here. Is there a mirror in there? Oh, it is. So God's word is the one true mirror. And, you know, um, when you read about the Proverbs 31 woman, the Proverbs 31 woman, uh, none of us are perfect. So we always have to come to his word. Have you ever seen that fit uh, mirror? That fit mirror, there's a mirror. It has a, it has a lady in there and you exercise. I need it too. I need to exercise. And so God's word, we come to this mirror and we align ourselves to what the word of God says. That's why we always have to go to the word of God. Amen? So Jesus teaches us how to deal with with anxiety and worry. How many of you sometimes get anxiety, get worry, what's going to happen? And so and so he teaches us in his word. And I want to go to uh, Matthew 6. I didn't write the scripture, it, but it's Matthew 6, um, 34, I believe. Let me go there. Matthew 6, 33 and 34. So what we can't see because of the fog and we have to walk through, God teaches us, you know, how to, how to do it. And Jesus here in Matthew 6, he's telling them from beginning, like from verse 25, he's, Jesus is saying, don't worry about tomorrow. Don't worry about like what you're going to eat, what you're going to wear. You know, we worry about things like that, except, you know, especially now with the economy, the gas, uh, you know, there's just so many things that go in our mind, or it could be your marriage, it could be the kids, um, just so many things. I have a son that just uh, got accepted to the police academy for San Francisco, and so I'm a mom. I mean, I don't want him to be a policeman, <laughs> but that's his dream, and he studied, he got his bachelor's degree, and so I have to learn to give it to God, or I'm going to make myself sick. And so... Um, Let's jump to verse 33. It says, um, so he's telling, Jesus telling him, don't, don't get worried about all these things. Like the Gentiles, that means people without faith, right? People that don't have faith, that's what that means for us now. And so it says, but seek, verse 33, but seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all those things shall be added to you. Verse 34, therefore, do not worry about tomorrow. For tomorrow will, will worry about its own things. Sufficient for the day 
is its own trouble. This is the scripture. I said, wow, I really like this. What it says to me, I have this cup I bought at Target. I like quotes, and there's this cup that says, be present. And I bought this, be present. So I bought this cup about a, about a year ago, and then this year we're doing a study on Matthew, and I saw that, and that cup came to my mind, be present. And sometimes we are not present today. It says, don't worry, Jesus is saying, don't worry about what you can't see or what lies ahead in the future. Yesterday's gone. Let's not miss the only time we have, which is today, which is now. Let's choose to be present, ladies. Let's be present. And we're going to circle around that thought later when we visit our lady that I chose for this uh, conference. Remember, Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, yesterday, today, and forever. Just like he was with me yesterday when I went through I had a, um, my first husband, yes, I said that. He walked out on me. He abandoned me. He left me with a little boy, and I was expecting another baby, and he left me. But God was with me. And you see me now here today. I have actually, I'm just a, I come from a small desert town, desert rat, and I've been to Italy four times. I've been to Venezuela. I've been um, to different parts of Mexico, and that's because of God. He didn't forget me. God knew what he was doing. I didn't know. You know, sometimes you might feel, well, what's happening here? But we got to keep our eyes on Jesus and be present. Amen? Remember, he will never leave you nor forsake you. One of the things is that sometimes um, Jesus, when Jesus said, um, don't worry about tomorrow, what, this lady, Corten Boone, says, um, why do you want to carry tomorrow's burden, right, and today's burden with you? But sometimes, some of us are carrying yesterday's burdens plus today's plus tomorrow's. And that's a lot, ladies. So the choices we make today affect our future. So let's be determined to walk by faith and not by sight. Amen. So the Bible's filled with many stories of many women who exercised faith, determination, and bravery. That's one of the things I see. A lot of these women, they were brave, and they were determined, and they had faith. And I want us to look at a story of a woman who lived through a dark and confusing time in her life. But yet, we will see her faith in action as she puts her trust in the promises of God. And we can view our own reflection in the lives of some of these women and see what we can learn from them. Amen? So before we get there, um, before we get to our story, I have to, we have to look at a promise that God made. And so let me see if I could get you through this. Maybe you've heard about it. I don't know. Um, so it's about the coming Messiah, Jesus. Remember, Jesus um, hadn't entered the earth in the Old Testament, right? He hasn't been born. But God's been telling them, that he's coming because man sinned. And so God had to, had to uh, change his plan and he bring Jesus. Because we are human and we make mistakes. We can't serve God on our own and we needed the Holy Spirit. We're imperfect and we keep making, right? Are you guys perfect? <laughs> so we needed a savior to help us with our everyday lives. Amen. So let's go to Malachi 4.2. I don't know if they're posting it, but Malachi 4.2, it says, The son of righteousness shall arise with healing in his wings. And so the son, S-U-N, the son of righteousness, is a title for Messiah, the, you know, our Savior that's coming. So Malachi, in the book of Malachi, we read the book of, if you want to go there, that's the last book in the Old Testament before Matthew. And so in the book of Malachi, Malachi was a prophet who, inst who was instructed by God to write about the coming of Jesus. And here he is proclaiming that Jesus will come and there will be healing in his wings. And these are not actual wings, but instead he wore a tunic with tassels. If you guys could put that one up. I robbed that from Asia. 
I was trolling in her Facebook, and I saw it. Oh, that's my message. I need that. <laughs> that one. That's really cool, Asia. I thought, wow, Asia. Wow, we're on the same page. Okay, so just this is what we're talking about. Doesn't a talit, this that really what it looks like? I'll walk over there in a little bit. Acting like a teacher. I have a son that's a professor. Maybe he took it after me. Anyway, so let me get this right. So this garment was an instruction for God's people to make and to wear. This, if you go to Israel, I, I went to Israel, little old me, yes. And if you go to the prayer wall, you see the Jewish people, the men, they have these. And they're praying with them to this day. Amen. And so it has... it. So it was a reminder in Numbers 15, chapter 15, verses 37 to 34, through 41, I'm sorry. I'll just read verse 39. It said, and it shall be a tassel for you to look at and remember all the commandments of the Lord, to do them, not to follow after your own heart and your own eyes, which you are inclined to, ready ladies, don't get insulted, this is God's word, to whore after that's what the Bible says. Sometimes we don't want to read that. We just want to read the good things, like, bless me, Lord. It's the Psalms. Amen. So that's what the, I only read verse 39. So that's, it was a reminder of the commandments. Because, see, God's commandments, many times we think they bring restrictions to our life. But no, God's word brings peace and protection and structure. And that's why God wants us to to keep his word at our hearts. Amen. So it had five tassels at the bottom hem of his garment. Each knot represented the first five books of the Bible, which is, they call it the Torah or the Pentateuch. And so the Bible, it, it, so it represented that, so the Bible commandments of God. So we got to remember something. The promises of God, this is real important, the promises of God are always connected to his commandments. Sometimes we want his promises, but we don't want his commandments, right? And I tell you what, God is good. He wants to bless you. He really does. He wants to take care of you and bless your family. God has been good to me. I have seen and God be good to his people too. You know, just really quickly, I'll throw it out here. Uh, one of the girls in my church, five years, she couldn't have to get pregnant. And she just recently found out she's pregnant. She, and um, we were so happy and so excited for her. Um, there's another sister also. She was five years. She couldn't have a baby finally. Um, she got all kinds of help, you know. She saw gynecologists, all kinds of, you know, there's a lot of good stuff out there to help you, assist you. But nothing worked. And the doctor told her, I can't do nothing for you anymore. That's it. But she gets pregnant. Praise the Lord. So God is good and God is faithful to his word. And he loves you. When you're faithful to him, he, he won't oversee that. So here we are. Um, so uh, let, me, let me go back. I'm throwing these little stories in there. I think they're helpful. So we got to remember Malachi proclaimed Jesus would come with healing in his wings, right? And in wings in Hebrew is the word kanaf. Also means corner. And these tassels were in the corner of the garment. And that would be over here. I know this one has a lot of tassels, but there's like a little square here with a, with a tassel with the five knots. And then these are over here on the, around. And so that's the corners. There's one here and one here. Okay, so this is really important to know before we go into our story, which you guys probably already know by seeing that, what story I'm going to. So really quickly, here's these white pages. When you were in... Um, Malachi and Matthew, there's these plain white pages. And there's 400 years here since the last writing prophet. And these are the last words that God gave his people. 400 years. And so his people are waiting for the Messiah. One of the signs is he was the Messiah, that he was the Messiah would be that he would come to heal, to open blind eyes, to open uh, the deaf ears, and also what it says in Luke, it says that he came to heal the brokenhearted. Isn't that beautiful? He's here to heal if you have a broken heart and to set the captives free. Captives of what? Drug addictions, depression. We could go on and on. It's really sad. A lot of people are held captive 
But Jesus came to set people free. So now let's read. Let's, we're going to go into our story, which is in, um, you can find the story in Matthew, Mark, and Luke. And I'm going to, I mean, I want to read all of the ones, but we're going to stick with Mark. And so, so I'm going to start with Mark 5.22. Now, one of the synagogue officials named Jairus came up, and on seeing him, on seeing Jesus, fell at his feet. And implored him earnestly, saying, My little daughter is at the point of death. Please come and lay your hands on her so that she will get well and live. And he went off with him. And so in Matthew it says, And then immediately Jesus gets up. And I love the picture in Matthew it says, And all the disciples got up, the 12 disciples. I love that picture of men serving God. That's a beautiful thing. And as women, we have to support. It's a beautiful thing. to We encourage men to keep going for God and to be the leaders they need to be um, versus bringing men down and saying, oh, you know, you're just always criticizing them. We got to lift them up. I'm a mom. What do you call it? I'm like Linda. I have all boys, like I said. What do you call them? Mom boy? Boy mom? Boy, mom, and now I'm a grandma, grandson, mom, grandma, grandma to grandsons. I haven't seen a girl. My daughter-in-law, we had a gender reveal, and I covered my eyes, hoping it would be uh, confetti, pink confetti. I opened my, cover my eyes, and all I see is blue confetti again. Ah, ah, another boy. Praise the Lord, God chose. That's what he wants. And I hugged my daughter-in-law before she saw the disappointment, but I but her mom was there, and she was the same way. We're both in a picture like this going, ah! My, I, I have six minutes talking, or I have six minutes left from 30 minutes. That's a lot of talking. Okay, so I'm getting distracted here. I just love stories. I love women with guys don't get us. Anyway. <laughs> so anyway, all the disciples get up. That's where I got sidetracked, and they start walking, and, and not only that, but in Mark, it says a great multitude follow him because there was people listening to him, and they thronged him, it says in the New King James. That means they crowded Jesus. They were pressing in into him. So all, And Jesus is going to Jairus' house with everybody following. They want to see Jesus is going to go touch this little girl's really sick to the point of death. But he gets interrupted by a woman. And so in verse 25... Here he is. He's on his way. Something really important, right? In verse 25, it says, Now a certain woman had a flow of blood for 12 years and has suffered many things from many physicians. She has spent all that she had and was no better, but rather grew worse. So she, here she is 12 years uh, with this issue of, you know, if women that are in menopause, sometimes they hemorrhage and they have to get... Um, go to the doctor, and so some of you maybe have had heavy periods. Boys, guys, to cover your ears. <laughs> and so this is a girl's class. Anyway, so, you know, if you've had, my sister suffered with heavy uh, menstruation, and it could be very, um, it interferes with your life. You, you like, I guess I better not get more graphic. Let me keep going. Anyway, so anyway, she, so she spin, spins everything. So under Levitical law from the Old Testament, she was considered ceremonially unclean because of the issue of blood. She was separated from the temple worship, church, church going to church. The C-H and S-H sometimes don't come out right. Where I come from, we spoke Spanish. Anyway, so she could not approach the temple no matter how deep her faith was. She was a spiritual outcast. And you can find those laws in Leviticus chapter 15, verses 25 through 27. And so imagine, imagine with me 12 years of isolation, of loneliness, 12 years of silence. Like, where is God? Where is God? You know, she's suffering. She's Spending her money on doctors. She can't go to church. She can't do anything. And so um, some of us, before COVID, we probably couldn't imagine. But now with 
with the COVID, I'm from the San Francisco Bay Area, California, the restrictions were very strict. So in December 2021, my, for example, a lot of this happened to a lot of people. And I don't know about Florida, but um, my daughter-in-law's grandmother was got COVID. And you know, after 14 days, it's gone. But she was in the hospital. She's 90 something, um, 93 or something like that. And so she gets other complications. She no longer has COVID, but they won't let the family see her or touch or touch her. Her daughter can't go in there. Her granddaughter can go in there, and they can only see her through the window. This also happened to my pastor. His wife couldn't be there. Um, his daughters couldn't be there. It always gets me. I didn't think it was gonna get me, but um, my aunt. You know, they could. They, isn't that awful? You, you know, you're in the hospital. You want your family there, or you have a loved one, your husband, your your child. You want to be there, comforting them, touching them. They wouldn't let no one in there. And so we can kind of imagine a little bit, right, her pain if we put ourselves in her place. But this is 12 years. And so I like verse 27, Mark 27. If we could put that one up, that would be good. Verse 27, there it is. I like this part. And when she heard about Jesus, when she heard about Jesus, she came behind him in the crowd and touched his garment. And Matthew says he touched, she touched the hem of his garment, like that picture. She's touching, she's reaching out. Remember, they're crowding Jesus. It's crowded. And when she heard about Jesus, she makes a beeline towards that crowd. And, and remember, she's not supposed to touch anyone. She could defile them, right? She could get stoned for touching a holy man like Jesus. She could get stoned. She's, she's not supposed to be out there, but she's brave. She's determined, and she has faith. Amen? And so she goes out there. She says in verse 28, where she said, If only I may touch his clothes, I shall be made well. Remember, she's thinking about the promise of Malachi. So she says, if I only can touch his garment, it shows me she didn't lose faith in God's promises. And, that's, and so we, my, my, my heart for you guys and for me, we cannot lose um, our faith in God's promises. She didn't quit. She didn't lose hope. Now, the Bible says, now faith is the substance of things hoped for the evidence of things not seen. And so we can't lose faith. Maybe you have a loved one that is not saved. Don't lose faith. No matter what they look like. I had a cousin that recently just passed away. He was um, ravaged. His body was ravaged by drugs and homelessness. And, um, but he got saved at the end. Praise the Lord. And I know he has a new body now and he's with Jesus. But you can't never give up hope, no matter what the circumstances people look on the outside. And so, just remember, during those difficult times, she remembered the words of Malachi. And so, by touching Jesus' garment, she is proclaiming Jesus is the Messiah, the one they've been waiting for. Amen? She recognized Jesus would be that, that he would be coming with healing in his wings. And so she reaches out for the corner of his garment. She put her faith in the promises of God's word. And so I, I read this in this woman's older women's uh, book. And I love what she said. It really just touched me. It says, so as she touched the edge of his long tunic. So she must have been at the bottom just barely getting in there. It was like turning on a great light in a dark room. She felt his healing energy go through her body immediately, immediately, and he too felt power leave him. You know how many of you know that the Lord, one of the names of God is Lamp, Nair. And he said, and there's a scripture in um, Samuel, did I write? 2 Samuel 22, 29. It says, you, Lord, are my lamp. The Lord turns my darkness into light. Imagine that light just like, boom, like these lights, boom, they just shine and they, you see all my defects. 
But you know, you, it just shines light. It, it shines into her dark, dark place of suffering, of hurting. And so um, the Bible says that Jesus, Jesus said, I am the light of the world. He who follows me shall not walk in darkness, but have the light of life. How many of you, you want the light of life? You want Jesus. Amen. He's the light. And he pierces through the darkness. You can pray uh, to pierce through the darkness of your loved ones, your husband, your sons, your daughters. If they're being walking in a wrong way and they're lost and you see them, you could pray, Jesus, shine your light into that dark place in their hearts. Holy Spirit, just um, waken them. Because sometimes we can't do nothing. Well, we can't. But Jesus can. Amen. And so the Bible says, with God as our lamp, we have the light we need to walk through any difficult circumstances. If we could get back that, the foggy, um, thank you guys, you guys are so patient with me. Um, that foggy uh, golden gate, that would be nice, that image. But um, the Bible says, with God as our lamp, we have the light we need to walk through any difficult circumstance. And there's a scripture that says, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil. And I was reading this one lady that went through Auschwitz. She was a Jewish lady. She went through that terrible time. And one of the things she, she said that really stood out in my mind, I thought, wow, that's powerful. It says, though I walk, it says, you don't sit there. You don't camp there. Sometimes we're going to go through dark times. It doesn't mean God's not with us. But we got to keep walking and you know that Jesus' hand is always extended to us. All we have to do, like the woman with the issue of blood, is reach out and touch him. Reach out and hold on to him, and he will walk us through that bridge of whatever you're walking through. It might, be, it might not be pain and discouragement. You might be going through a time of temptation. I don't know, maybe God put me to say this because it's not in my notes. Maybe you're getting tempted from some nice-looking guy, buff, muscle guy at work, and you're like, woo, oh. <laughs> when you're my age, you get flattered. Oh, you said, oh, oh thank you. <laughs> um, but that ha you got to be guarded because the Satan wants to destroy your family, wants to destroy your marriage, so don't act like you're all holy. You're human. You're human. I'm human, and I've seen marriages be destroyed. It's very painful. It, it hurts the whole family, kids, everything. Uh, one of my, my daughter-in-law said, her sister said, her sister walked out on her husband, and within weeks, she's, well, a month, she's already pregnant. She says, oh, if it's love, then it's all good. As long as, in Spanish, she said, donde hay amor, no hay pecado, or something like that. Where there is love, there is no sin. She twisted it. Just what, that's what Satan does. Amen. So I really got sidetracked. But, you know, that's the darkness of the enemy's lies. Because of God's light, though, he exposes our negative emotions. How many of you know sometimes we get negative emotions? We become critical. Like maybe you have jealousy, anger, unforgiveness. Any sin, sin that brings you down and so, but Jesus wants us to live in, he gives us peace and freedom. So let's close up the story. Um, I'm going to go to verse 32. So she touches him. He feels energy come out. And he looked around to see who had done this thing. But the woman fearing and trembling, she's trembling because remember, she could be stoned. Knowing what had happened to her came and fell down before him. And told him the whole truth. In verse 34. And he said to her, daughter, your faith has made you well. Go in peace. Jesus gives us peace. Even in the midst of chaos. He promises, he promises us peace. Maybe we're still going through the trial. But there is a supernatural peace that only comes from Jesus. How many of you want that peace? Amen. I want it too. Praise the Lord. In another uh, version in the ESV, it says, take heart, daughter. Your faith has made you well. 
and instantly the woman, the woman was made well. So, praise the Lord. So we got to remember that Jesus rewards faith. He, he, remember he was going to Jairus' house, and it's a very, very serious issue. This little girl, it's a little 12-year-old girl, I believe. She's going to die if Jesus doesn't get there on time. But Jesus turns around. He stops for this woman. And he turns around and he sees her. And she's trembling. Oh, man, he singled me out. He saw me. And he calls her daughter. Amen? By calling her daughter in front of all these people, you guys know what he was doing. He's protecting her. He's bringing her back into society. He's giving her dignity, and he's making her clean. You know, ladies, the Bible says love your neighbor as yourself. And sometimes we don't value ourselves. We don't see that God values us just the way we are, skinny, medium, fit, unfit. Um, maybe you have a, all your kids in your church or they're not. He values you. He loves you. And I think many times the problem is that we don't value ourselves. And because we don't value ourselves, we can't love other people. I know for myself, sometimes if I'm critical with my son, I think, well, one of my sons, maybe I might be critical. And I think, I'm doing that because I'm being critical of myself. And so we need to learn how to not ask the Holy Spirit to catch us and not put ourselves down. Amen. So praise the Lord. I'm almost done, girls. We're almost done here. So Jesus gives us peace, and he gives us joy. He, what is he, he says he gives us beauty for ashes. So she, this lady was now free to go to the house of God and worship. How many of us take our everyday lives for granted? Now she could go home. She could touch the family, wash the dishes, you know, clean, you know. And sometimes... The everyday duties, the routine of making dinner, washing the dishes become mundane, boring. And we think, what is this? This is, do you know what? Nobody cares, nobody, um, you know, cares what I'm doing. They don't, uh, what's that word I'm looking for? Appreciate. They don't appreciate. You, don't you feel unappreciated sometimes in your job? Or at home, and we're focused on the wrong thing. We're not focused that we get to do this for other people and that God has placed us there. This is our today. And today we have to mop the floor. Well, maybe you're lucky and your husband does all the housework, but mine doesn't. So, and so he'll help me. He'll, don't get me wrong, he'll wash his clothes. I guess that's pretty good. And, uh, but most of all, most of us women, we, we do the cleaning, right? We do cooking, we love our families. And so we want to live in a clean house, and we want to do these things. But sometimes we, 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 don't, we take these things for granted. Taking the kids to school, we, we're complaining. We're no longer present in our ministries, our families, our marriages. We no longer, like I said, appreciate and respect our husbands. Right? I think the longer you're married, you've got to be more careful with this. I've learned this. I'm 59. And I've, and I've been married 34, going on 35 years. And I realize, and I, and I like to pay attention to study, but I, I've seen older, older couples. So the wife is always nagging and nitpicking on the husband, and the husband has become so mellow, he just lets her blah, blah. Because they, they, they mellowed out. You know, after years, you young people, they'll, they'll mellow out. <laughs> but anyway, we just got to be careful with our attitudes the attitudes we carry when we're doing our everyday to day chores. Maybe you go to the same job and you don't like your job and you go there every day. And you know what? I worked 12 years. I've told you the last time I was here, I was a school secretary for 12 years. That's a very, I hope I'm not being recorded. That's a very hard job because you're in the front desk every day. The mothers come in. The kids get injured on the playground. The phone is off the hook. And so I had, as I was driving, I would drive into the school. Sometimes we had lockdowns, and it was crazy. Sometimes we're, some days were crazy, but I would pray, Lord, this is the day that you have made, and I will rejoice and be glad in it. 
And we got to do that, ladies. We got to remember who we serve. Amen. Um, so it's remember, um, I have another cup. It's, just, it's in the little things. And so it's in those insignificant that we think are insignificant that are actually the most significant. It's in the little things that we lose sight of God. We need to ask the Lord to help us see him in everything we do. Every task, every big task, every small task are all part of his plan. When you come to church, you that have ministry, the nursery, we neglect the nursery. It's a women's class, right? I like to bring this in. We neglect the nursery, the kids, or the next future. And so we go in there. I don't know about Lehigh, Victory Church. Do you go in there rejoicing? Or you're like, ugh, I have nursery. Or you pretend you sit in the front singing. And somebody has to come for you, sister. Uh, sister, do you remember you have nursery? I don't know. If that Does that happen here? I don't know. But I've seen that happen. I've been a Christian since I was 17. And the church, El Central Church, they had like 500 people, and so I see how women behave in nursery. Then I, now I've been a pastor's wife for 25 years. It hasn't changed, but I remind them that Jesus loved the little children, right? And they're the future. I've seen kids grow up. Now they're part of the worship. They do all the planning. They are amazing, amazing people. And I've seen them when they were little, and I was teaching Sunday school. So even when things don't make sense, and things are unclear and blurry. God sees a full picture. And God sees you. God hears you. And he loves you. And you're his daughters. Amen.